okay, so thanks for coming. Uh, what I want to talk to you about uh, today, and I know I'm talking to an audience of React Native developers um, about the the struggles or the the good and the bad of both React Native and of Flutter, but I think you guys will um, hopefully uh, uh, relate to, to what I'm saying since we've we've kind of been on this on this framework and, and we know we know the good and the bad. So uh, I'm Simon, like Harry said, I do I do training and consulting. Um, and then I have a software agency as well, uh, previously at uh, Google and before that at Facebook. I don't know if we overlapped, but I think Harry used to be at Facebook too at one point in time. Um, okay, cool. So um, as you may know, so Flutter is uh, a little bit younger than React Native. So React Native uh, is from Facebook and uses JavaScript and or you know your your flavor of compile to JavaScript language. Uh, Flutter uses Dart, which I think is like a, a really interesting difference there. Um, and so we're likely going to uh, touch on some strengths and weaknesses of a framework that you love. And so it's worth mentioning that I really like both of these frameworks and I've kind of made it a priority to be uh, fair uh, as, as possible. Um, and so like uh, for the next 15 minutes, we're gonna kind of dive into the strengths and weaknesses and um, kind of compare these, these frameworks um, and hopefully we'll land on some concrete, you know, like, like the key takeaway I want um, you to have from this is uh, what the React Native either community or the React Native, uh, uh, what we as developers can learn um, or can take away from, uh, uh, from looking at, at Flutter, which is the, the competitor in some ways, the strongest competitor out there right now to React Native. So, um, you know, if you, if you rewind with me back to 2015, um, uh, uh, sort of coming out of Facebook was this, this new hot thing that was kind of not so much write once, run everywhere, but more like, you know, the, the, the mantra of the time was learn once, uh, write everywhere, which was the, the key uh, that they were trying to solve. And so the initial goal um, of basically bringing all the things that we love about React from web over to mobile, like a declarative approach to UI, you know, one way data flow, all the things you guys do every day, um, composition of components, of UI components. And so um, the key to this was that uh, uh, React Native was, was sort of the first um, kind of JavaScript-based cross-platform thing that was not a web view, was not HTML and CSS, right? It's, 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 it was native components and that was fairly groundbreaking. Um, and, and despite some rough patches, right, along the way, um, like, you know, navigation, like which we've been through like seven iterations of, um, and, and with a lot of help from the open source community, um, we, we've effectively delivered on that original promise, right? Like learn once, write everywhere, like you can be almost as good as um, as native, but with the kind of speed and agility of writing in JavaScript. And and this large ecosystem is formed around React Native and you have lots of different choices when building, um, you know, you different design patterns and, and state management and, and even the language that you write in, right? So like if you wanna write in JavaScript, great, or TypeScript or uh, uh, Reason ML, or, you know, there's like any number of languages that compile to JavaScript, like hopefully not CoffeeScript, but you know, you guys get the gist, right? Um, Kotlin, I guess, technically can can compile to JavaScript. So, so that's really uh, powerful, um, and it imposes very little opinion on anything, right? Like, th like it doesn't really dictate the way you do things besides the view layer. Um, <clears throat> and this could be considered one of its weaknesses. So, uh, if we think about the sort of tech stack that we use today in 2019 with with React Native, uh, TypeScript is probably what you would use if you're starting out today, you know, if you're on a legacy code base, it might be different expo, which is like all of the things that should be in React Native core, but aren't uh, React Navigation, obviously, um, you know, kind of all the modern React stuff. Um, but let's flip over to uh, uh, Dart and if I can get my if I can get my slides right, um, and so you know if we rewind again to 2015, where we were kind of when when Facebook was uh, uh, releasing uh, React Native um, at the at this at this fairly obscure Dart conference, which I'm sure nobody in this room went to, and uh, probably very few people were really into Dart in 2015. Uh, Google announced this this uh, project or, or teased at this project uh, codenamed Sky, um, and and it was claiming that like Dart as a real like take Dart seriously as a programming language. It is so fast it compiles to native and it can run 120 frames per second on Android, which is like really impressive on the Android devices of 2015, right? <clears throat> And so, um, you know, it was kind of, you know, we don't, people didn't know if it was vaporware or whatever it was, but because there was like nothing behind it except for a demo. But like two years later, it just sort of materialized and, and it was announced and we have this like, uh, you know, it was named Flutter and it was uh, sort of like, it came out the door with, with first class support for both platforms and, and really um, kind of delivered on a lot of the things that uh, React Native maybe didn't have in, in the early days. Um, so for example, Um, 
Okay, cool. Um, so, so, it, so it kind of it, it kind of came out of the door with like this like rapid development across both platforms, top notch performance with this kind of like innovative GPU accelerated rendering, which is like the key, like the really key thing about the technology behind Flutter, right? Is that it it kind of runs if you think about like a game engine, how it just like renders pixels and like puts them straight to the GPU onto this kind of canvas. It doesn't like use the operating systems kind of like APIs to to use the operating systems native components. It it, it it's really just use the uh, operating system as like a blank canvas, right? Um, that's maybe a poor description compared to how the Flutter guys would like to describe it, but that's kind of the gist of it, right? Um, but it has all the, the modern stuff we would expect at that time, uh, you know, stateful hot reloading, and, and, it, and it came with like a robust set of tooling and stuff out of the box, UI components and everything, right? And so um, I think it was like really interesting that, that Flutter chose Dart as its programming language, which was relatively obscure language at the time, um, but it's key to know that like internally, right, Google had been betting on Dart for years and it wasn't winning on web, right? It was initially aimed at like, we're gonna replace JavaScript and you know, we're gonna ship a Dart you know, VM with Chrome and everything. Um, and that and that did not gain traction for whatever reason. But internally, like there was still like at Google, a bunch of people who liked Dart. So, you know, when choosing a language in whenever they started this project 2014, right, they were like, okay, um, Dart seems like a good candidate at that time. Um, which I think was maybe a unique decision, knowing now what we do about the landscape of languages. Um, and, and we had this sort of second mover advantage. So everything uh, uh, that React, every mistake that React Native made, Flutter could look at that and be like, okay, well, we're not, we're not gonna make that mistake. We're gonna come out strong um, and, and sort of like move quickly. You know, cause if you remember React Native, they, um, they shipped iOS sort of mostly baked, 80% baked. Then six months later, they shipped like half baked uh, Android, right? And then like two years later, we kind of had all the pieces together to, to really develop on both platforms. But um, let's look briefly at, at, at what they both have in common. Uh, you know, they're both open source, cross-platform, declarative approach to UI is pretty important because that's something that kind of React uh, uh, sort of uh, popularized, right? And um, especially the kind of component-based architecture. Um, and strong performance characteristics compared to its predecessors. Uh, predecessors. So, so if you think about React Native, came out with like really strong performance characteristics compared to what the cross-platform story was at the time, which is like HTML web view stuff, right? And it was like, hey, here's native stuff, it's really fast, we got this bridge thing. Um, and similarly then, you know, Flutter came out with uh, really strong uh, uh, performance characteristics of, of its time too, right? Um, you know, heavily invested by, by tech giants, not going anywhere anytime soon, kind of hopefully, right? Never know. Um, Google tends to kill things at times, Facebook too, right? Um, but I think more importantly than how they're similar, or more interestingly, um, we should look at uh, sort of how they're different from each other, which is that um, we, we kind of want to look at these particular criteria, right? Like what's provided out of the box is a strong uh, uh, indicator, I think, um, of, of what is a, a core difference, right? The, the language, the styling engine, the you know lay, layout and styling, type safety, things like that. So, and the ecosystem. Um, and we'll touch on performance, but I don't think I'm, I'm, this is this talk is not a deep dive into performance. And the reason for that is because both frameworks are more than fast enough for what you're doing with them, right? Um, I mean, if you're building a 3D game engine, that's like totally different. You don't use these kind of frameworks. But I think for business applications, for consumer applications, for for the things that we're building, both frameworks um, tick all the boxes. They run perfectly well on new and old devices, um, you know. And then you'll you'll find some edge cases where you have to jump into native land. Um, but I don't want to focus on like what is the 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 you know performance on on these. Kind of edge cases here. But I do want to talk about developer experience and ecosystem and community and libraries and things like that. So we'll start with Flutter. And so um, the one thing is, is like when you first jump into Flutter, it's it's actually a really fantastic experience. You jump in there, um, you know, you have to learn this new language, but it's a really easy transition to make from a React Native developer or from a, from a web developer. Um, you get this out-of-box experience that is like incredible. Like it, it's incredibly complete, I should say, right? It gives you everything you need. You get these comprehensive widget libraries, you get a uh, theming that's like, you know, f from the first moment you uh, start your project, it's like, what is the font face you want to use and the sizes and what is the colors? And like you set up a few settings and then just like the theme just magically kind of flows throughout your entire application. Um, navigation is like right out of the box. It's like, um, you know, well-documented, easy to use. And so like, frankly, like Flutter does kick Rack Native's ass in the out-of-box in like the out of box experience uh, overall. And I, and that was the, the very first thing you notice when you jump in there. It's, um, it, it was well thought out and uh, provides what you need. Um, the authoring experience, right? Editor support, you get the, um, you know, considering like 
Dart is not a language that you're natively going to have support for in your editor, you can um, install this one plugin and just everything works, right? Your click to definition, your uh, syntax highlighting, your autocomplete, everything. Um, and, and it's an easy language to pick up. Like it's surprisingly easy. Like there's no crazy concepts that you've never heard of in there. It's, you know, kind of standard OOP-ish stuff. Um, and when you don't know what the API of something is, you just like go to go to source. Like you click through and you look at the actual Flutter source code and and you can see, okay, these are the arguments this is expecting. And um, that was very, like I found that very helpful. Um, and, and stateful hot reload, it's kind of hard to explain without you actually experiencing it, but this stateful hot reload was just, it blew my mind. Like I had not experienced that on something that felt so native uh, prior to that. It doesn't feel like refreshing a web page at all. It feels like, um, it, it, it just like, you know, maybe similar to the Swift UI experience that is starting to be popularized right now, but it, it is totally worth experiencing. Um, and so the rendering engine, the, the interesting thing is like, this is the selling point. This is the magic sauce that they have uh, with Flutter, which is like this innovative high performance GPU pixel pipeline thing then, and, and like in doing so, they've recreated all of the native operating system components in both a material UI flavor and in a iOS like Cupertino flavor. Um, and it's all provided out of the box, but like the best thing is, you don't even notice. Like you just build your thing, you just be an application developer and you don't even know that there's this crazy rendering engine or GPU, whatever, like it just, it just works. Um, and, and it bears repeating that like the widgets, the theming, the navigation, the scaffolding, the standard library, like if you remember in JavaScript land, um, you know, the first time you had to try to figure out how to format a date or the hundredth time you had to figure out how to format a date, right? And you're like, do I pull in moment.js? Like, what do I do here? Do I manually like split some strings? Um, or, you know, just do basic string manipulation. Um, you don't have to think about that. Like it's provided in a real programming language out of the box. And, and these are the, some of the things we, we forget that we're lacking in JavaScript world, right? Um, however, right, Dart, like Dart is a struggle. Um, you know, after you get through the, okay, I can understand this. These are familiar concepts to me. It is a struggle to just like bury classes of like, just like OOP inside of like instantiations, inside of inheritance, inside of like boilerplate. And so like a, a perfect example is like, I want to add border radius to something. I can't just put like border radius four, right? I have to like instantiate a, a box decoration class and instantiate a border radius class and then radius that's circular. And, and you just see this over and over and just like levels of nesting. And I get that there's like performance characteristics of not parsing a string at runtime or whatever, but um, you pay a penalty, right? You, you definitely pay this like verbose boilerplate cost. Um, and it's, um, it, you know, like it is what it is. For If you're a Java developer, you're like, yeah, sure. I mean, like I have to write seven lines of code to do this, like I understand. Um, and it even has some niceties that Java doesn't have, like named arguments. But if you come from this modern language like, you know, Swift or, or Rust or something, and you're not, like don't expect to have this amazing language experience with Dart because it's not there. Um, it, it, is the, it is like the bare metal kind of OOP stuff. Like you can't just, um, you know, in JavaScript, open a curly brace and just put some key value pairs in. Like there is no equivalent to that. You have to create a class, describe the, the, um, the private, you know, properties on that class and then, you know, use a constructor. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, if you come from TypeScript, it's like, yeah, that's tedious. It's a bit brittle, but it's not a deal breaker. Um, but you might think to yourself, at least Dart has safe and a sound type system, right? And you would be wrong. Um, <laughs> you'd be wrong because they don't have null safety. I mean, it is, it is a, a, a strongly typed language, um, and it will not let you assign a string to a number, but it does not have null safety. And this is kind of the thing that early Java suffered from. And um, and you start to realize, like, why did it take us so many years in computer science to figure out that we need null safety? Um, but for better or for worse, you can just say, here's a string called foo and just not assign it. And it's like, sure, okay. Um, similarly, you can just, like, call an array out of bounds. And it's like, okay, well, um, I guess we'll just throw a runtime exception. And so, um, you know, currently I should say Dart is not null safe. They're working on it. Um, there is um, an effort that at least the issue is one year old that says like, we're gonna add this non-nullable by default stuff to the next version of Dart. So, um, you know, there was a time when TypeScript, I guess, was not null safe also. So, you know, take it as you, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Um, and so like, be prepared as a beginner, you'll jump in there, you'll forget to initialize some variables and you will see null pointer exceptions. Um, and you, and they might sneak through to production, um, among other exceptions. And this really kind of gets me as a programmer is that I, you know, I call like a datetime.parser, I call a function, I don't know if it's gonna throw or not. 
And so I may not find out until runtime that like when I give this a thing that the user inputted that it throws and then I'm like, okay, cool, I'll wrap it in a try catch, not the end of the world. But you don't always know ahead of time that I need to wrap this in a try catch, right? Um, now, you know, like somebody who's been programming like Flutter and Dart for many, you know, years might laugh at me and be like, that's such a new mistake. But th this is the experience you get when you go in into it. So just, you know, uh, layout system, right? So you saw a little bit of layout. It's a little bit verbose. It leads to a lot of nesting. So th the way it works is you kind of like add a layer of nesting for everything you want. So you want to add padding, you kind of wrap it in a padding thing. You want to add border, you wrap it in a border thing. And you kind of uh, wrap over and over, which has an interesting kind of, um, side effect that you don't realize, which is that you can't easily abstract it out because it's built into the structure of the code. It's unlike just adding like CSS, you can abstract CSS out into another file, right? Um, but overall, you get used to all this stuff and you, you know, ultimately pay a small, you know, some would say it's a small price to pay for such a fantastic native level fast, you know, super hot reloading, like very nice to work in and you can move quickly. Um, as a developer, so you know that's the price you pay, right? Um, so, so we'll we'll kind of move over to React Native and um, kind of talk about its strengths and weaknesses, which you might be more familiar with with these. So, the uh, you know lets you move fast, building high quality UI. Um, that's kind of the promise. Um, all the things you already love from React on web. Uh, so your hooks, context, you know, your render props, like these are things that like we take for granted, but they don't exist in other frameworks, right? Um, especially hooks, right? Uh, flex layout, I think it's clean. You can like learn the rules of flex in an afternoon and 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 be productive with it, right? Did I lose? Okay. Um, and and TypeScript, I think, is an incredibly uh, sort of ergonomic language with with this incredible type inference. Um, you could do a lot of things with safety. Um, like, you know what I mean? You can instantiate, um, you know, you can pass really complex functions to functions and things like that. And if you do your, your types correctly, uh, you won't shoot yourself in the foot and you won't have a runtime exception. Uh, okay. So, uh, Expo, I probably don't have to sell you in this room on Expo because you guys are React Native developers. It is, it is phenomenal. I don't think I've seen anything like Expo and other, uh, sort of development, um, sort of tool chains. Um, it, it's really hard to convey how much this impacts the developer experience, especially from getting going early on in projects, right? Um, you know, sending a, an Expo link, you know, to, to replicate a bug, you send an Expo link to somebody, they open it up, they can immediately have this reproducible thing, right? Um, especially with like Expo Snack, things like that. Um, it supports web as a first class citizen. Um, that's pretty important. You know, you get these build tools in the cloud, these over the air updates. Uh, so, you know, font loading, asset optimization, things that really should be in React Native core, right? Like an icon, you know, like that should ship with React Native, like let's be honest here. Um, and so when we compare TypeScript with Dart, um, and I think this is a fair comparison because they're both fairly strongly typed languages that have little edge cases that aren't fully safe, um, um, yet have a dynamic kind of nature or meant to, to, to come from uh, or be appealing to dynamic programmers, right? Because remember, Dart was originally poised to kind of replace JavaScript, and it turned out TypeScript won that battle, right? Um, but you get this thing, things that you don't get with Dart, right? So explicit null safety is pretty important. We talked about that, but union types, you forget how important it is that you can just like I can make a function that, that accepts a string or a number, right? And I can do things accordingly with safety. Um, or I can return string or null, right? Or I can return an object in curly braces with a status code and, a, and some data. Um, you can't do that with, uh, like you can't return A or B. You can't even return just a key value pair. Like there is a concept called a, like a hash map, obviously. But um, there are things that just feel natural to, for us to do in TypeScript that you can't do in Dart. Um, you know, including like just tuples. There's no tuples in Dart, right? Uh, destructuring, things like that. Um, so we, you know, we use these every day. And to, for people who aren't familiar with these features, they're not missing anything. But if you use these and you go to a language that doesn't have them, you notice it, right? Um, and you know, language preference, whatever. It's usually biased based on the previous languages you've been exposed to. So if, if you've been using Haskell, you would probably think TypeScript is like awful because it doesn't have like whatever functional thing, right? Um, so an interesting discretion thing here is that React Native, the rendering engine uses the built-in platform provided things, right? So if you open a calendar on Android, it's going to use the operating systems date picker, right? If you use a calendar on iOS, it's going to use that terrible scrolling wheel thing, you know what I'm talking about, for choosing a date. And like, for better or for worse, it uses what the platform provides. And um, and, and that's good in many ways, right? So like, you, you get this like action sheet in the bottom on iOS, and you get something, you know, modal thing in Android. Um, however, like it does, 
like these things are similar in many cases, but slightly different, right? So like how does a particular view handle an overflow um, can be slightly different and it can be a little bit frustrating and we'll definitely get to that. Um, so what are the but, right? Like these are all the amazing things about React Native that I probably don't have to sell you on and like what is the but? Like like where does React Native fall over and, and kind of uh, flutter shine, right? So the out of box experience is just, um, um, I, I wouldn't say it's terrible, it's just empty. You just don't get anything, right? You get like a handful of components that sort of work across, you get next to nothing. You don't get navigation, you don't get theming, you don't You don't have any component library. If you literally render a, um, a text input onto the screen, it's invisible because it has no height and it has no border, right? If you, it, like, I, So when I teach like beginners and stuff and they wanna put something on the screen, they're like, where is it? Like it didn't work. I have to refresh again and I'm like, no, no, it's there at a height and then add some like border and you have to be able to see it. And, and you realize that there's just no widget library, right? So you don't even have an icon. There is literally no way to tell React Native, please use this font family across my entire application, on my buttons and my text inputs and my placeholders and my headings and my like alert dial, like you can't. Um, you have to roll your own theming library or find one on the web. And so you'll think to yourself, well, I'm really lucky that I live in a world where so many things exist on the web that are fantastic. And then you see NPM and you're like, NPM is a hot mess, right? It is just full of like other people's code that may or may not ever be maintained again. Um, and you hope these two things work together and everybody ends up with their own kind of cocktail of different UI components and you know state management paradigms and everything. And no two React projects are alike in the world, right? <laughs> Give or take. Um, and so internally at a company, you just standardize one and like whatever, right? But like in general, the out-of-box experience is like a, a, a little bit painful compared to Flutter um, because you just don't get much, right? And, and you just kind of like hope that the library author maintains it and that the next version of the library doesn't break backwards compatibility, uh, which it might. Um, and you have a package.lock file or whatever, a yarn.lock file to make sure that you don't break in a minor version, things like that, that you just don't have to worry about in the Flutter world. So you end up with this, this mix of packages and that kind of whole thing that I just described is the fragmentation problem, right? And and that's not the only problem, right? So you've got upgrading, like if you've ever upgraded React Native in historically has been really, really difficult. Flutter people don't think about that. They're just like, okay, I just like click a button. It's, it just happens, right? And, and things don't break for whatever reason. Um, you know, maybe it's just really internally well tested or maybe the same people who write the upgrade are also writing the packages, but things generally don't break. Um, uh, you know, you know, we have this kind of issue in React Native world where it takes us four generations or three plus generations to get anything right. Um, you know, uh, we finally thought we nailed animations with animated and it was built into core and then it was like, well, actually, no, that doesn't really, you know, let you do certain things. And then so um, was the one that came from Wix. It was like, it wasn't reanimated, it was uh, interactable. And then we got reanimated and then we got gesture handler. So we think we've nailed animation and gestures now, right? I think we've got it. I would have said six months ago that we nailed React Navigation, but now the next version that's coming out, which is component-based and lets you use context, finally got it right, I think. We'll see, right? But but you couldn't use like React Navigation, like current versions, current stable React Navigation, you cannot pass anything with context and actually access it because you pass these complicated configurations and renders and things. So um, I'm sure you've struggled with that. I shouldn't have to describe that to you in too much detail, but I want you to get the big picture of this like, you know, like all these little micro packages out there that are give or take solving some of our problems. And if you've ever had to figure out um, how to do keyboard handling and you've used a keyboard avoiding view um, and then you've had to been like, okay, do I configure it with padding or height? The, the one that needs to change. If you get, I don't know if you guys have done that. Um, or you've tried to um, teach a beginner how to use alert in a way that works the same on both Android and iOS, it is literally impossible. Like look at the docs and you'll realize how the first argument of alert is the same, it's a string, but all the other arguments are like how to display, which buttons to display, totally different across two different, like it's just nuts. Um, and so, so we do have this, so like remember, it was never designed to be right once run everywhere and it shows, right? Um, it's close, it's 94% of the way there. Um, and so anyway, is that a small price to pay for the developer experience? Like, I think so, right? Like we're gonna struggle with some incompatibilities and in return we get this like phenomenal framework that lets us use hooks, right? Um, so uh, kind of in like to summarize everything we just talked about, like what do we think, like what's the takeaway besides just like pointing flaws at these two frameworks? Like how can we look at that and been like, okay, what can we do or like what can we learn as, um, as the React Native development community, right? assuming we don't have any core developers in this room, in which case um, we can tell you a lot of things. Uh, but as the community, right, um, we know what we want. We, we do want write once run everywhere. We, 
we don't like we don't want to have to worry about things being slightly different on the two different platforms, right? Um, there are times when you do want a very different look on the two platforms, but that's not really what I'm describing. I'm talking about when like behaviors are slightly different, particularly keyboard handling and stuff, right? Um, we don't want to think about the platform. We, we, you know, if you think about web, right? We've been used to a platform on web where we can build things and they just run the same on Windows and Ubuntu and Mac or whatever, right? We, like save a few small things like fonts. Um, and so we don't want to wade through a dozen packages to find a, a, an image carousel, right? And but currently we do, and we don't know which one to pick. So we just like ask our buddy, and he's like, "Well, I used one six months ago, and it was this one, and it kind of worked, right?" Um, we don't want to wonder like, "Does this work with this version?" I don't want to mess around with tsconfig or package.json or app.json or Babel config and Metro config and like all of the things that I have to do um, to kind of just get something out of the box. Now this is a solvable problem, right? Um, and I don't want to have to think about like, "Is this package that I'm pulling in does it have TypeScript definitions or not?" Right? Um, not to mention, if I do a um, on TypeScript on like Dart, if I press like Command click to like go to definition, it's going to take me to the TypeScript definition file buried deep in Node modules, and I don't actually get to see the source code, right? Um, and then I have to like dig up some minified JavaScript thing, um, which is a struggle, right? And and it's something that I think the community can learn from Flutter, and we're getting there. I think it, there will be a time when we all ship TypeScript alongside our npm package or in such a way that we can actually view the source, right? Um, in an ideal world. We would have officially sanctioned systems for types and testing and navigation and animation and internationalization, like as a pain point I haven't even touched on yet, right? Um, fonts, icons, theming, fetching, caching. I like I don't want to mess with this like keyboard behavior um, every time that I build an app, right? Every new project that I start or, or image caching is like an issue. Font sizing, if, if you've ever like had something that looks great on an iPhone simulator and then you run it on an iPad and the font is tiny and stuff, it's like we don't want to like and then you pull in. React native uh, uh, responsive sizing, right? Which is like some NPM package. And you're like, this is going to work great, right? And then you have to configure a bunch of stuff and then it changes the way you do style sheets and things like that, right? Like this isn't a problem that we should have to think about as application developers. I don't want to think like, okay, I'll load my PNG from the from the disk, but now I wanted to load a C, uh, an SVG, but I can't. Like you can't just like load an SVG and display it. Like there's a lot of these small things that I don't think the core, um, I don't think these are on the radar of the core developers. So the community is finding ways to solve them. Um, if you were on web and you had to write special logic to make the tab button move the focus from one form field to the next form field, you would probably think that the web platform is broken, right? You would expect the browser to figure these things out for you, but we overlook that we have to think about these in React Native world. We have to actually write like the, the keyboard has a next button and that that next button like moves the cursor forward. Um, these are things that we have to do in React world that other frameworks don't have to think about in React Native world. Um, so the good news is all of the things on the slide that we just talked about are like solvable today. We don't have to wait for core to implement the, we don't have to like um, uh, invent something from scratch, like internationalization and theming and fonts and icons. Those are solved by other people. The difference is that each one is solved by somebody else. Um, like, you know, theming is solved by Wix and something like, you know, uh, a widget is solved by call stack and like all these different companies have solved the different pieces. Um, so, and, and we end up gluing some things together, but it is solved. Like these are solvable stuff, right? I can make a layer of abstraction on top of forms to make that the cursor advances to the next form field. I can uh, build a great UI kit or I can use React Native Paper. I can uh, curate and maintain a list of community libraries that are sanctioned for use at my company that I know will work with the version of React Native that is sanctioned at my company. And I can tell my developers, you don't have to think um, about which carousel to use for images because we have one and we've already decided that it's good. Um, and we've already done the research to, to see if it works with React Native uh, Gesture Handler, right? Which is something that you probably want, right? Um, but um, that's because we are filling in the gaps that React Native uh, ecosystem or, or core has, has left. And, and that is something that I think we can um, try to sort of make de facto standards for or push our companies to make a de facto standard for like the the same way that react navigation has just become the standard for navigation um we need standards for internationalization and theming and whatever else right um and that's kind of where uh, uh we come in like that's where uh, uh we as the community we should try to kind of figure out like okay use another framework this other framework nails you know, a, a widget library. Like, how can we learn from that? Like, how can we build something, or how can we get our company to open source something that we use and 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 promote it, and and maybe even get core to maintain it? Because what React Native really needs is a comprehensive standard set. Like, what Rails, what Ruby on Rails did 
12 years ago for the web development community, which is like, this is the way you do web development. And then people kind of learn from that, right? That would be nice if React could uh, fill in that gap. Um, and if you work on a large product team, um, you may not run into these problems as much, right? But if you but if you work on smaller projects or you work on more off projects more oftenly, um, then the uh, the responsibility is kind of on us, the developer, the community to solve the gaps. Um, and so, how am I looking on time? I guess we're good on time. Uh, this is uh, this is basically the end. So um, please go out and try these other frameworks, and um, and and I think you'll learn a lot. And uh, does anybody know what these two icons are? Speaking of frameworks, yeah. All right, what do we got? <laughs> okay, that is true. Um, <laughs> okay, I heard Swift UI. Uh, yes, so Swift UI, which I think is um, uh, uh, really revolutionary in that they took what we kind of learned from the community over the past four years, and then they just baked it into the into the platform, right? And and I think that and so this is the lesser known one that came out like three weeks before Swift UI, and nobody ever um, like because you know Apple knows how to do product release and Google doesn't, um, so Google just buried it in Google I/O. But I think it's actually really noteworthy. So this is this is not just Jetpack. This is like Jetpack Compose is a declarative Kotlin. Um, framework that is currently released for Android and coming out soon on iOS as well that is that is native compiled code but that feels or at least is intended to feel like React Native um, and hopefully it gives us all of the really cool stuff um, that we get out of Flutter which ironically is also from Google so you know we'll, we'll have two things we'll have two competing things from Google which is probably a little bit uh, uh, unheard of and that's it that's all I have so um, find me on Twitter and yell at me about my terrible opinions, and thank you very much for listening. I will say one plug, um, uh, which is that I run a software consultancy, so if you guys need React Native development, we don't do as much Flutter. Um, we have started doing a little bit of Flutter, but um, and then I also do uh, React training um, through a couple of different organizations. And um, So yeah, hit me up on Twitter if you need anything at all, uh, and come talk to me after this. And I, if we have a few minutes, I'll take a couple of questions. Thank you. We do indeed have uh, a couple of minutes, uh, so we're just going to take two questions, and uh, I'm going to hand this back, Mike, back to um, Simon. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I developed a React Native app for fun a few week, a couple of months ago, um, and I thought it would be. It was very simple: a few couple of forms, few API calls, whatever. It should, which I thought should be a day. It took me three days. A lot of that time was struggling to figure out whether I should use like. React, React navigation or React native navigation, and whether I sh which like component library to use, and so I'm curious to know like if these problems are solved, why is is there somewhere that I can go or anyone a new developer can go and see like okay these are the things you should do if you're starting a React native project today. Um, I would love for that resource to exist, and if it does exist, like I don't know about it, and um, probably every software agency has their own little cocktail of things that they use. I know we do, so at our agency, we just kind of pick a handful of things, and the UI kit that we really love is React Native Paper, um, because it's written in TypeScript, so it behaves well with TypeScript, and it's made by Callstack.io, which are like really good in the community of maintaining stuff. Um, navigation is React Navigation, so like I know these things inherently in my brain, I don't know that anybody has articulated them somewhere, and if they did, I might not agree with those, so I'll make my own list, and then somebody else will make their own list. So, um, you know, how do we solve that? How do we put something out there that's like, this is your go-to place, right? And how do we even rate something, right? Do we say, okay, the one with the most stars on GitHub is the one I use, or the one with the, um, the you know, the most commits in the last 30 days? Like, I'm, I'm not sure how to, like, if there's a scoring system out there and, and the best way to do that. But I, I would love to um, be involved if people in the community are creating these kinds of curated lists of things that are maintained and useful and things like that. Last question. Yeah. Um, between the two platforms, like, how do you compare the um, SVG, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. how, because I was kind of disappointed with, with the last time I really used React Native, I was kind of disappointed with the SVG support. Yeah. I. I wish that was baked into core because you know that the operating system has it, right? It's it's it exists um, in native land, but we don't have access to it. So um, the the last one that I saw was like parsing SVG in JavaScript land, and then um, rendering those as elements onto the screen. Because if you look for React Native SVG, it is a um, it's almost like a DOM kind of for SVG, uh, which is probably not what we're looking for. We want to display it like an image, right? <clears throat> 
So um, anyway, it exists. The, 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 as far as I know, the, the sanctioned, the currently common sanctioned way to do it is you use a Babel transform that transforms the SVG into React elements um, before uh, at compile time. And then you just render those like you would import any other element. Yeah. Um, it works out of the box. You just like, it's like displaying a PNG. I mean, like, that's the thing. That's what I'm getting at here, right? Like, like Flutter has solved these things in, in a way that makes sense. So, okay, that's what we got.